if I look over at you and nod for her to look at her too. Yeah. So we're gonna go right from the last chorus of this one. I will to you, Jesus. Yeah. Right into the chorus of hearing the worship nice and big. Okay. And that's it. Okay. I can lead out on the hearing to worship. Yeah, we'll do the chorus, then we'll go back into verse one. You can lead out on that. Okay. Well, good morning and welcome to church service. I hope your heart and mind is ready to engage in prayer, fellowship with each other, and interact with the Word of God. For our prayer list today, our missionary is Tom and Carol Wallace. They are missionaries to England and have been for many, many years. I'm going to keep them in prayer. Church members, the list on the screen, choose a name off that and pray for them. And I wanted to give you an update on Barbara Eastburn. We prayed for her last week. She was having... Um, potential cancerous brain tumor and after all the testing they found out that it's not it's benign and uh, Rick wanted to make sure that you were thanked for the prayers for Barbara and uh, we want to make sure we always pray for our president vice president members of Congress the United States Armed Forces fire and rescue law enforcement that God would keep these men and women safe and bless their efforts and uh, Allow us to continue to have a tranquil society in which we are free to preach and teach and fellowship and worship however we wish. We need to make sure we thank God for that. Let's all stand for prayer. And if you want to find a place here to, in the front to kneel and pray, please feel free to do that now. If you want to pray for somebody specifically, this would be a great time for intercessory prayer. But primarily it's to, it's to prepare our own hearts, to open up our hearts, calm our mind, get rid of all the distractions, and to... Seriously consider the truths from the Word of God today. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings of this beautiful day, the weather that we get to enjoy, this uh, wonderful state and this free country in which we live, the abundance that we enjoy every day, the freedom and safety that most of us uh, ex um, experience on a daily basis. We thank you for those who keep us safe, those in law enforcement and fire and rescue who at a moment's notice would be at our side if necessary. For the sheriff's deputy who's here today patrolling our halls, we ask you to keep him safe as he or she strives to keep us safe. We thank you for our president and vice president and members of Congress, even when we don't agree with them, when they say or do things that um, perturb us or confuse us, we thank you that you have ordained these people as your servants, whether they realize it or not, and that you use them in powerful ways. And you work in spite of them, and you work through them. And we thank you that we know that you are the one who sits on the throne, regardless of who's in the White House or who's in the Senate and who's in the House. But we pray that you will bless these men and women in such a way that they deliberate truth, that they become statesmen. For those on the United States Supreme Court, that you will give them a sense that you are the great high judge and they should certainly fight for truth and uphold our Constitution. For our missionaries around the world, particularly um, Tom and Carol Wallace in England today, may you bless them and let their ministries be fruitful and as they're far 
far away from family, may you bring them that sense of closeness and comfort and love that only fellowship can bring. For every person who's here today, as we delve into the issues we're talking about for a few weeks, may you uplift every heart. May we leave encouraged. May we leave with a focus of how we can have hearts full of joy and live for you. May we take the effort to share joy with others, to, to lift their day, to lift their spirits. And may you bless the fellowship we have. We give this service to you and all that we do in it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. As these return to their seat, please take a moment to shake hands with those around you. Make sure everybody feels welcome. As there's still some coming in from the lobby, they can get a good seat. Good morning. Let's enter into our time of worship together. This song has a response that you guys are going to help us out with. And uh, Emily's going to help you with that part. It goes like this. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. For He is good, He is above all things. With a mighty hand and outstretched arm. You sing it out. His love endures forever for the life that's been reborn. His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise.
seated. Just a few brief announcements, but uh, one word of encouragement. If you ever played sports, you know there's a halftime speech from, a, from the coach telling you what to do for the rest of the game. And I'd just like to encourage you to put a little more effort into the singing the next two songs. So let's, let's rally ourselves, get our, turn our rally caps on and sing with a little more fervor the next two times we sing songs. First of all, please take a note of your bulletin. There's some things in there you need to read for things we have coming up in the next couple of weeks. This Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, we're having our Awana Awards. Notice the change in time, 7 rather than 6.30. It'll be over in the gym. Hope you all make an effort to be there to honor the hard work of our Awana workers and even the great memory work of our children. That's this Wednesday at 7 o'clock. Only two weeks until Mother's Day. So mark it down. You can't forget Mother's Day of all the holidays. Make sure you have that down two weeks from today is Mother's Day. June 2nd is our next church work day. It's a Saturday in which we try to recover from some of the um, uh, wear and tear throughout the school year. School is done by that time and we do some cleanup and if you can set aside that Saturday to be with us we greatly appreciate it. June 2nd and then the Rise Teen Camp which Matt will tell you about in just a little bit is June 4th through 8th. Let me ask for all the kids to stand up and leave with Chuck and Amy for Kids Under Construction. They're going over here to the side. If you want to go to Kids Under Construction, follow them off. And let me ask for Carol Tucker to please come up to the front. I've asked her to make an announcement about an opportunity we have that's just, it's the timing of it that's coming up right on the, right in the next week. And I'd like for you to consider this uh, possibility. And then a short video is going to play during the morning's offering. Carol? Oh, you need a microphone, don't you? Hello. Thank you. Um, what I want to talk to you briefly is about survivors in sync. As many of you know, one out of eight women are diagnosed with breast cancer, and I was one of those. Breast cancer survivorship is a club nobody chooses or wants to join. Survivors in sync, or CIS, is a drag and boat wellness program for breast cancer survivors that practices here locally in Benderson Park. We have sisters on this team that range from age 40, and our oldest gal is 80 years old. Each of us here today has an, a possibility and potential to impact a person, a cause, and a community. And on this week, May 1st and 2nd, you can be the one that makes a difference by supporting Survivors in Sync during the 2018 Giving Challenge. With the Great Giving Challenge, you can make a difference for this group. Each donation that you match, or each donation you give will be matched one for one, up to a $100 donation. Uh, you can do this by visiting givingpartnerschallenge.org on Tuesday, May 1st at noon through Wednesday at May 2nd at noon. It's just a very short window, and you make a donation online. We really appreciate your support, and we'll watch a video. I'm going to pray before the offering, but let me ask, uh, how many of you here, there's somebody in your family who's been affected by breast cancer? Raise your hand. And I've been here 26 years, and I've lost count of the number of women who've come through our church family who have suffered from that, and because of the progress made in medicine, have also survived it, and there's many of you sitting right here today. So this would be a worthy cause and something to consider. Think about that you can contribute to our community. Let's pray for this morning's offering, and then you'll have a chance to watch this video. Back, Eka, excuse me, out in the lobby uh, at the coffee table, she'll have some flyers to explain further about it. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege we have to give. We thank you for how you've blessed us financially and how you continue to meet our needs, and, and we have the opportunity to not only uh, bless others in our community and help those in time of need, but bless our missionaries as well. We thank you for the way you've supplied for our church and the generosity of this church has displayed time and time again. We ask you to bless the morning's offering and each person who gives. May we give out of a sense of faith, out of a sense of joy, out of a sense of purpose, and out of a sense of love. We ask you to bless this offering in Jesus' name. Amen. I was the one. I was the one. 
I was the one. I was the one. I was the one. I was the one. We cheer each cancer victory, curse each devastating diagnosis, paddle with all our might and race to win. Not content to sit on the sidelines, we strive to achieve better physical health through training and racing, and better mental health through a strong support system of other survivors. I could be so happy, healthy, and loved. I believe dragon boating with Survivors in Sync is what has guided me past the 10 year mark as a stage four survivor. Survivors in Sync has created a great camaraderie among women paddling for a life after breast cancer. A bunch of beautiful, strong, encouraging women welcome me on their boat. You would never know some of them are in the middle of treatment. I love being part of the team. This is the most amazing group of women. I don't know what I would have done if I didn't have their strength behind me on and off the water. Survivors on land, athletes on the water. Dragon boating has empowered me beyond belief. Every breast cancer survivor could have this experience. I feel strong, supported, and invincible. On May 1st, your donation to Survivors in Sync will be matched one-to-one -to -one through the Giving Challenge. Be the one to make a difference. stand together and we're going to continue in our time of worship.
the cross, I surrender my life. I made all of you. I made all of you. Where you love, red, red, and my sin washed white. I owe all to you. I owe all to you at the cross. At the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I made all of you.
began to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Let's just sing this chorus, turn your eyes. And turn your eyes upon Well, we are in part two of a series that I originally entitled, Why Don't Believers Have Peace? And then as I examined it this week, I felt like that title was too negative and the approach was coming from the negative side because if you're not feeling peace, or if you're struggling with depression, the last thing you need to add on to it is more guilt, that you're not measuring up to some standard. So we're going to change the title to How Can Believers Have Peace? And uh, let me quickly summarize last week's three points, by living with Christ's return in mind, by having the mind of Christ, and by trusting God, which last week was by not worrying. I want to remind you that I have lived by the principles I'm going to be sharing with you today and some next week and last week, and I also have not lived by them. I have had both experiences, and I can tell you when I live by these things that I'm sharing with you, life is much better I am much fuller, I have a greater well-being, and life is good. When I don't live by them, I suffer the anguish of it. So I know what I'm going to be sharing with you is true. And that they are not um, cliches, they are not just little superficial band-aids. If you let these go deep into your heart, I think they will help you if you are struggling with despair, anxiety, or depression. Next week, we're going to talk specifically about depression, physiologically based depression. How do we respond to that when it's rooted in your physiology? When there is no trigger, there's nothing you can point your finger to and say, well, if I just react better to that, this feeling will go away. In physiological depression, there is nothing to pinpoint that you can do that will make that feeling go away. Well, as Christians, how do we respond to that? There's a chorus I like to sing when nobody's around, and it's praise the Lord, hallelujah, I don't care what the devil's going to do, faith and prayer is my sword and shield, Jesus is the Lord of the way I feel, and I sing it, but I don't always necessarily claim it to be true, but the way I'm acting that day. But if Jesus is the Lord of our lives, he should be the Lord of the way that we feel as well. So last week and today is about those things that we can factor in, we can control, we can address. Next week, it's how do we respond when it's sort of out of our control, when it comes upon us and we can't explain why. So let me define some terms again. First of all, peace is the state of well-being 
that results from exercising the grace to trust in the sovereign benevolence of God in the midst of change, uncertainty, hardship, and heartache. And this is available not some of the time. It's actually available to us all of the time if we understand how to pursue it and apply it. What is worry? The anxious contemplation of bad things you fear may happen or good things you fear won't happen. And the common denominator is fear. Paul wrote to Timothy, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and a sound mind. So we have peace that's offered to us. We tend to worry and we fret and we get upset. What is the, uh, what's the factor that makes that happen? Well, there's a one word, it's called expectations. Expectations are those things that we want to happen or we believe should happen or we think must happen or we're entitled to them happening or we've done all the necessary work to make it happen so it's only reasonable and logical for it to happen. And although that might be true, we might not understand that sometimes our expectations are unrealistic, they're unavailable, they're unwise, or they're blocked by somebody or something outside of your control, or God doesn't want it for us. So we have to learn how to frame and control and guide our expectations. We need to learn how to discard the ones that might be unwise, unavailable, unrealistic, or blockable, or out of God's will, and learn how to focus on those expectations that are the good things, but how do we control our emotions? Well, if you have an expectation, whether it's met or unmet, the first thing you must do is accept the outcome. You have an expectation, and then something happens, and it fulfills it to some degree or not. Accept it, and then take the step of faith to rejoice in it. Paul told the Philippians to rejoice always, and then he said, and again I say, rejoice so we, we accept the outcome and then rejoice in it. And if we can do those two things, it can lead to contentment. But that's a, that's a, uh, a, a journey of faith. It's a predetermined choice you're making to accept, rejoice, and then contentment is the result. But if you don't accept it, then in sets we go downward, whether it's met or unmet, is disappointment. You have an expectation and something happens that doesn't measure up and you're disappointed. Disappointment then leads to discouragement. The discouragement then leads to discontent. Discontent, if it goes on long enough, leads to disillusionment. And then disillusionment can lead to total despair. And if despair hangs in there long enough, you have depression. Now depression is, is not necessarily something you should be ashamed of. Many Christians feel like if you're depressed, you're just not a good Christian. And there's something wrong with your character, your faith, or you're weak. And, and we, we need to dismiss that if we want to respond to depression correctly, whether it's physiologically based or in our thoughts or in our spirit or just from exhaustion. We have to see it for what it is so we can respond to it correctly. Thinking about depression can get you depressed. When I was reading through the indications that you're depressed, I started reading through them and thinking, am I depressed? And that got me depressed, thinking about I'm, some of those things sound like me, and I try to be upbeat, try to be positive, but it can be a challenge sometimes. So spiritually speaking, how do we address it when our despair or down blue feelings are not because of some malfunction or dysfunction of the brain chemicals, it's really because of the way that we are responding to our environment? How do we correct it? Number one, by looking to Christ for peace. Sounds very easy to say but it is a spiritual discipline. John 14, 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So Christ has given us peace. He's left us with peace. If we don't have it, the failure is somehow on our part to access it properly if our lack of peace falls into that category of our response to our world rather than some kind of a chemical uh, disturbance in the brain. What we often do, we feel peace when we experience an answered prayer. We're down, we're anxious, we're concerned, we're worried, we pray, we get the answered prayer, and boom, we have peace. 
And that's a natural reaction for every believer to have. But it would be much better if we took peace in the one who answered the prayer before he answers it. Because he's always there. He's always the same. But we hold back our, our peace to accept it. We cling to our anxiety until we get what we want. When all along, the Prince of Peace is with us. We need to look to Christ and not to our prayers being answered. I believe there are times when the Lord, and this might trouble some of you, but the Lord withholds things from us. He removes things from us so that we'll look to Him instead. Because if not, we can get so full of all the blessings of life and things are going just the way we want that we lose our sense of need for Him, which is why Jesus said, it's harder for a rich man to go to heaven than it is for a camel to go through the eye of the, or the small door inside the big gates of the city, which was about the size of a man's door. Get a camel to go through that, that's easier than get a rich man to go to heaven. Not because rich men were evil, because rich men would sense no need in their world. So oftentimes I think the Lord withholds things from us. And it's not to punish us. It's to bring us closer to Him. It's to make us desire Him, want Him, look to Him for fulfillment. How do you look to Christ for peace? You look to Christ for peace by contemplating Him. Thinking about Him. And that takes, that means you've got to set aside some time. You've got to shut this off and turn this on. And they have to contemplate Him. To worship Him. Worship Him means to contemplate His worthship. What is He worth from us? To praise Him. To verbally acknowledge His attributes. The good things that He's done. Sometimes take the time to literally speak out the good aspects and essence of Christ's nature. And you might find the list keeps going. Because one thing you say leads to the next, and it leads to the next, and it leads to the next. You cannot overstate the goodness of God. It's infinite. And to take the time to do that. Most of the time when we pray and we face life's troubles, you and I gaze at our problem and we glance up at God to see if he's paying attention. But if you want to have peace, we gaze up at God and we glance at our predicament. But we flip it. We're so focused on this, we don't pause to look up. Look to Christ for peace. Number two, by not loving the things of the world, and this might be one of the most difficult, because we were designed and created to respond to this world. John 16, Jesus said, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace, in the world you will have tribulation. We know that, yet we still look to the world to fulfill us, to remove our anxiety, to make us feel better. John writes, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And Solomon adds in Ecclesiastes, he who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver, nor he who loves abundance with increase. The abundance of the rich will not permit him to sleep. Now, if I asked you how many of you here love the things of the world, if we we're honest, we'd all have to raise our hand to some degree. We love the things of the world because they look good. They feel good. They taste good. They give us a sense of security and fulfillment, influence, power, and safety. We were designed and created by God to interact with the things of the world. God is the great provider of the things of the world, and he wants us to appreciate it and enjoy it. God is the one who made the world enjoyable. He made us to, to want the things in it, but as in everything we do, we take it out of balance. We want more than is what is given to us, and we can't seem to shut off that desire valve. But not to love the things of the world, it's not a prohibition of loving what God has provided, but not to love it first and foremost. To love nothing more than you love God. So Paul writes to Timothy, Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Now we all know that, but we, we forget it for some reason. We live for getting right now, knowing we came in naked, we're leaving naked with nothing. Nobody's even going to go with us. We're, we're leaving this world alone with none of our possessions. Yet we still hoard and hold on to and protect 
and shield and obsess over the things of this world. Paul says, having food and clothing, with these be content. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. Now, if you're in the category of loving the things of the world, you cannot remove the things of the world from the top of your love list without replacing it with someone or something else. You've heard the phrase, the expulsive power of a new affection. If you want to get rid of one affection, you've got to replace it with something else. You can't just discard it. It leaves a void. It leaves a vacuum that will be filled. We're not creatures of denial and deprival. You and I were designed to consume, to absorb, to receive. That's the way God designed us. That's how we interact with our world. That's what makes dieting so hard. Dieting is about deprival and denial. Unless you find the good diet, which isn't based on denial and deprival, it's based on replacing the bad with the good and then satiating yourself with the good. But without the satiating of yourself with the good, you long for the bad. So you have to replace. Well, the same thing is true spiritually. Remember, hunger can never be eliminated, but appetite of that hunger can be cultivated. You can learn what you like to eat, physically and spiritually. Number three, by letting go of the things we look to for peace. Jesus said in Matthew, when he prayed in the garden, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Now, this is Christ letting go of something that would have given him tremendous peace. He was about to go to the cross he was about to suffer the greatest physical torment you could and the greatest spiritual pain by having his father turn his back on him, reject him, pour his wrath out on him. He's about to face that. Peace for him would have come from that being avoided, from him not having to experience the shame of being a sinner and taking all the sins of the world and having his loving father look on him with anger. That would have given him peace but he had to let go of it to accept the Father's will. In Exodus 14, Moses said to the people as they had come to the uh, Red Sea, and the Egyptian army was behind them, and they have no chariots, no horses, no army, no nothing, which that is what you would look to in that kind of situation. If an army was coming at you, you would draw peace from the army that you've gathered. They couldn't look to that, so Moses said to them, be still and see the salvation of the Lord. To let go of what you're looking to and look to God instead. In Psalm 46.10, the psalmist writes, Be still and know that I am God. In 1 Samuel, David says, All this assembly, he's shouting this out to Goliath, shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord. In battle, you look to the sword and spear, and David says, no, we don't. We look to God. In Psalm 20, verse 7, the psalmist writes, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. And in Proverbs 21, Solomon says, the horse is prepared for the day of battle, but deliverance is of the Lord. So when we're not foolish. You don't get rid of your supplies. You don't get rid of your provision. You don't get rid of your protection or your elements of safety. But you don't trust in that. If you have a coin in your pocket and you pull it out, if it's an American coin, it'll say, in God we trust. Now, we don't do that. America certainly does not do that. But that was our initial slogan. That was the creed, the call, as America faced impossible odds. And God would have to get involved if we were going to pull this independence thing off. Well, it lingered for years and became a legacy. Now it's just a, a quaint statement, but it's true. Even with all the armies we might have, if God wants something else to happen, that is what's going to happen. Regardless of your political viewpoint or what you think is right or wrong about Donald Trump, it's an interesting, it's an interesting play of what's taking place. All of the political establishment is against Donald Trump. All the media is against Donald Trump. How is he getting anything done? How did he even get elected? You can take it back years before. President Obama. A lot of negatives were there. How did he become president? 
God will raise up and take down who he wants, when he wants, the way he wants, for whatever purpose he wants. You can figure it out, you can factor it out, you can make your plans, you can lay the strategy, but God is the one who gives the outcome. Even when the Lord uses people, events, circumstances, and things to meet your need and, and bring you a sense of well-being, it is always he who's giving the provision. So what you and I tend to do, we tend to look at the means through which the provision comes rather than through the one who sent it. Every person who blesses you, every person who gives you something, they are just a conduit of God being the one who's providing it for you. But we forget that and we don't look up, we look there. We look at the channels instead. We need to let go of the things that we think hold us to peace. Solomon said, don't lean on your own understanding. And Paul said, we walk by faith, not by sight. So by looking to Christ for peace, by not loving the things of the world, by letting go of the things we look to for peace, and then next, by fixing our minds on God. Isaiah 26, 3. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Now, I want to talk about four words that I'm going to read you some more verses that contain these words. First is that word stayed in Isaiah 26, 3. It's the Hebrew word samuk, and it means unmoved, supported, fixed. And the implication is by God. That your mind is fixed and supported and uh, focused on God alone. Then there's the word stand in Greek, estekete, and it means to stand strong, to plant your feet, to abide in a position, to entrench and to dig in. You'll hear that word in just a minute. Then there's the word meditate. In Greek, it's logisathe, and it was, we get the word uh, logic from that family of word, and it means to calculatingly consider something, to carefully reflect on it, and to seriously ponder it. So this idea of fixing your mind on God means to focus and isolate it on God and who he is and what he can do, to meditate and ponder who he is and what he can do, and then to entrench, ground, and dig in yourself right there and become unmovable. Now listen to these verses. Philippians 4, 6. Whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Meditation is not a passing thought. Meditation is to grab that thought, bring it back in, and chew on it. Like a cow chooses on cud. Just continue to chew on it and think about it and turn it and twist it and ponder it. Galatians 5.1, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Ephesians 6, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Stand, therefore, having, your, having girded your waist with truth. Philippians 4.1, stand fast in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 6.13, watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave and be strong. Romans 5.2, we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the glory of God. That standing, that meditating, that staying, that fixing is all about making him the primary focus of any situation, any trial, any trouble, any trauma that you are in. And it happens throughout Scripture. We have Stephen, as he was being stoned, looked up and saw Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father and had perfect peace as his body was being executed. Peter fixed his eyes on Christ as he's walking on the water in the midst of the storm. And we know what happens as soon as he takes his eyes off Christ. He begins to seek. Elijah's servant, who feared the armies of Syria who had amassed around he and Elijah, until Elijah said, Lord, open his eyes that he might see. And he could see all the chariots of heaven also encamped around. And then he had peace. David said about the wicked, God is not at all in his thoughts. So then Isaiah adds, there is no peace to the wicked. Because their minds aren't at all fixed on God. He's not even in their thoughts. Paul writes this admonition. 
casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Fix, stand, meditate on God. And it puts everything else in focus. Uh, a few weeks ago, Colleen and I and her parents and Brooke went up to Gatlinburg, Tennessee. And they had this great game room that had just a whole bunch of wonderful games to play in it. And they had this one, all I remember was it was a big panda bear. Uh, it was a video game, but it had these things to punch on the side. And as these things popped up on the screen, you had to huh, 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 and punch these things like that to knock them off the screen. And it gets faster and faster and more come and more come. And as you're doing that, the more you get, the more tickets you get. And the tickets you get, you go over there and you turn them in for really cheap prizes. But still, it was fun. So Brooke and I were doing that together. And sure enough, she got the one, she finished the third round and out came a thousand tickets. She got them all and cleared off and we were cheering and hollering so that I kept trying to do it. Then I did it. We got a thousand more. So the next, the next day we said, let's go back. Let's do it one more time and we'll go up there and we'll clean this place out by buying cool stuff. We ended up getting some candy, uh, a battery charger for our phone. Like, it was fun. But that last time we were getting tired. First, our knuckles were hurting, the wrists were hurting from pounding and getting too excited. So we decided, let's split up. I'll take the left side and you take the right side. Because we had now done it 10 times without getting to the thousand again. So let's do it at the same time. And I won't even look. I won't look at the right side of the screen at all. I'll just look at these three things right here. And you just look at those three things. So we're standing next to each other and we're just hitting the things like that. Didn't miss a one. Out come the thousand tickets and in comes the candy. All right, that was us fixing our mind on this and not worrying about anything else. So we told each other, don't look over here, you just look there. And I'll look here, and together we beat it. That's what fixing your mind means, is to get rid of the distractions and focus on what you must, even if it means just to get through the day. And the best thing to focus on is God and His goodness. Next, by submitting to the Holy Spirit, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 20, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the Spirit. Ephesians 4, 29 and 30, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Ephesians 5.18, do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. So the Bible tells us not to resist his promptings, not to violate his prohibitions, to let him have full control of our thoughts, our feelings, and our actions. Thankfulness is a commanded instruction from God. We cannot not be thankful without grieving and quenching the Holy Spirit. We're commanded to be grateful, and it greatly benefits us. When we obey it, we please God, and we feel better. It brightens the darkness when you express thanks for something, even if it's the thing that's bringing you some darkness. What's the benefit of pleasing God? Well, not quenching and grieving the Spirit. And what does the Spirit do? He gives you love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So Paul writes, we are to be filled with the Spirit. We're to live in the Spirit. We're to walk in the Spirit. We're to be led by the Spirit. We're to pray in the Spirit. So grieving and quenching, resisting, uh, defying, or even ignoring the Holy Spirit's ministry in your life prevents all those good things from bearing in you. As does being unthankful. So the Bible tells us to thank God. That's one of the acts of submitting our attitude to the Holy Spirit. Next is by obeying the truth. John 13, 7. If you know these things, Jesus said, blessed are you if you do them. In James, James writes, he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in his deed. Samuel told Saul, to obey is better than sacrifice. To do what you know you're supposed to do. That's one of the keys to having peace. Jesus said, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, 
I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them, he will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. In Paul's great description of peace in Philippians 4, after he described it, he said, These things do, and the God of peace shall be with you. So obeying the truth. And then by praying the right way. It might surprise you, but there is a wrong way to pray. And I'll just read a couple of verses here, then make some comments. Matthew 6, this is Jesus. When you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the corner of the streets, that they may be seen of men. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Philippians 4, 6, be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 6, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. James 5, let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Let not that man suppose he'll receive anything from the Lord. For a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. James 4, 3, you ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss. That you may spend it on your pleasures. Then James says this a chapter later, the effective Fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So prayer is much more than asking God for stuff passionately and then wholeheartedly believing you're going to get it. That's not the application of faith. That if you can crank up enough faith to think you're really going to get it, that that is what God is looking for, that's just human desire. What God is looking for is faith when we pray. And faith might not be knowing you're going to get what you ask for because you might be asking for something stupid and not know it. And just stop and think for a minute. How many times have you asked God for something and later on you went, Phew. I'm glad he said no on that one. Because we don't, we don't have the perception that God does. Prayer and faith is knowing that God will always do what's right. He'll always provide what he wants you to have. He will never, ever fail. You and I just don't have the wisdom to know what that always is. But God does Prayer is done is to be done without worry, <clears throat> without selfishness, with gratitude or thankfulness. It's to be done in the Spirit. It's to be done in faith. And it should be fervent, genuine, sincere, passionate, wholehearted, authentic, non-ritualistic. And you can't do it without any resentments. Jesus said, if you don't forgive your brother, don't come to me wanting stuff. Here's a, the model prayer that Christ prayed. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. This prayer offered up by Christ as a model, as, an, as a sample, is given to people who are about to go through the most horrific persecution they ever could have conceived. Many of them having their families wiped out, losing all of their possessions, themselves being tortured and killed just because they say, I believe in Jesus. But they had passionate prayer lives. Because their focus wasn't getting what they want. Their focus was not my will but yours. And that's where real faith rests. And the last point is how do you have peace in the midst of trials and troubles and tribulation? By anticipating heaven. John 14. Let not your heart be troubled, Jesus said. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Paul writes to the Thessalonians, Someday we will meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. 
Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Why did they need comfort? Because they were being persecuted. And their loved ones were dying for the faith. And Paul says, the day is going to come that all those who died before us, they're going to precede us. And if we're alive when Christ comes back, we're going to be called up. And we're all going to be together again. Comfort. Why do you need comfort? It's when you're in anguish. It's when you're in sorrow. It's when you're in fear. With the idea, someday we will all be together. So Paul says to the Corinthians, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has entered.